My guest started his career at NIH in 1979. It wasn't too long after that that the AIDS epidemic emerged. His work was pivotal in turning an HIV diagnosis from a death sentence into a manageable chronic disease. Dr. Clifford Lane is the clinical director for NIH's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Lane, welcome to the program. Thank you, it's nice to be here. I wanna start with that other virus, COVID-19. You established a public-private partnership led by NIH that sets clinical research priorities for COVID. How does that work? So that's something that really um, was started by the NIH director at the time, Dr. Francis Collins. It uh, utilizes the um, foundation for the NIH, which is a private entity, to bring together in one forum a variety of different government agencies, HHS, Health and Human Services, the VA, Department of Defense, uh, together with an array of private industry partners, as well as other academic partners to help um, harmonize to a degree and prioritize to a degree the types of research that's done uh, in the setting of COVID-19. Um, it has um, split into different entities, uh, elements of that, a preclinical looking at tracking the variants, a clinical developing protocols and deciding which drugs to treat, and then looking at some of the issues related to vaccine development. It, it really was something that, that grew out of the need to have uh, coordination and prioritization at a national level for us uh, during the research response to COVID-19. And, and you alluded to this because you helped set up treatment guidelines for COVID. I wonder how confident you are that we've got the best treatment and management protocols for this virus. You know, uh, treatment guidelines um, are typically uh, living documents as opposed to anything that's static. We are continually learning more about this disease. And as we learn more, we think it's very important to get that information out to the public. It was interesting because some of the response that we've made to COVID-19, in fact, was informed by what had been going on in China. The World Health Organization sent a delegation to China in late February of 2020. I was fortunate enough to be part of that delegation, see how things were evolving in China. And by that time, which was approximately two months into their outbreak, the first outbreak, they had gone through six sets of treatment guidelines. And it was clear that there was going to need to be that type of guidance for the clinicians in the U.S. So we were very happy to get the mandate basically from the White House task force to put something together and to keep it updated over time. I mean, we've had over 50 updates and somewhere in the range of 20 million page views. Take us back to the 1980s, Dr. Lane, when HIV first arrived on the scene. What was the initial reaction at, at NIH to AIDS? Yeah, it was it was it was a pretty amazing time. We, you know, we had a disease. It was a devastating disease. It was striking young men, really in the prime of their lives, and they were dying. And we were admitting patients um, to our hospital, the clinical center um, of the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, at first, we didn't know what the causative agent was. It was suspected to be an infectious agent. It was obviously later determined to be the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, but it was just an incredibly uh, intense, sad, while at the same time motivating a period of time where you, you, you so wanted to help the patients, but we had so little that we could do. So again, in those first days, it really was trying to diagnose the infections, treat the infections, but knowing even if you were successful in treating infection A, that you were soon gonna be facing infection B or a Kaposi sarcoma or a lymphoma. And it just, each patient was a progressive downhill slide. We have a COVID vaccine, we have a flu vaccine. Where's the HIV vaccine? HIV vaccine is still an aspirational goal. I mean, HIV is a pretty difficult virus. It has the ability to change very rapidly, even within a single uh, infected individual. So thus far, there have been some successes in eliciting immune responses with vaccines. There's one study that showed some very modest protection that has yet to be replicated. So it remains a, a real challenge for the scientific field. And Ebola is another very dangerous disease. Uh, a few years ago, the Democratic Republic of Congo requested your help during that outbreak. What did you do there? 
in the middle of a war, I might add. It was it was interesting. Based on some experiences we had during the West Africa outbreak a few years earlier, we had done a randomized control trial of a drug called ZMAP. And while we couldn't show whether or not ZMAP was of benefit, it appeared not to be of harm. So we used that experience to use ZMAP as a control arm for a randomized controlled trial of the different therapeutics for Ebola virus disease that looked promising at the time. So we had ZMAP as the control, we had remdesivir as one of the uh, experimental arms, monoclonal antibody 114 as a third arm, and then the Regeneron cocktail, cocktail as a fourth arm. And we compared those four treatment regimens and found that the Regeneron cocktail and the monoclonal antibody 114 that had been developed actually by the NIAID Vaccine Research Center, they were clearly superior to the control arm in terms of survival. And those two drugs now have been licensed for treatment of Ebola. Of note, and as you say, uh, this, and, this, and and Dr. Lane, I just want to wrap real quick by saying, you know, you could have worked anywhere as a doctor. What do you find rewarding about uh, government service? The thing that's rewarding about government service is it, it the mission is the focus. There is no other focus to it. It's not uh, how many uh, relative value units you generate in a day. It's really what you accomplish and how does that improve public health and the health of the individual patient by extension. All right, Dr. Lane, thanks so much for being on the pro program and for your service. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.